Chapter 7 Duck Eggs When Derek got back, he didn't turn the lights on. Without his mum and Connie there, the house was suddenly feeling cold and damp, like a building already long abandoned. The flames that had disappeared from the rat still smouldered in his head. He put on the television to try to take the sharpness off the silence. He sat on the floor with his back to the aga and talked to the dogs. Pumpkin put her head on his lap. He stroked her soft hair and tried to think about everything. He slipped into something close to sleep. After not very long, he jumped up to a ferocious banging. The dogs were growling at the front door. Dawn was only a faint lightning yet. He stood silently and looked through the kitchen window. There was no car in the yards. He considered leaving by the back door, sneaking away through the rear paddock. Instead, he went to the door with a poker in his left hand. He opened it a squeak with his shoulder against it in case someone pushed it. Standing back in the shadow of the house was a small figure. As it stepped forward, Dark entered full fright mode, kicking the door open while raising the iron rod in both hands, ready to swing. Just in time, he recognised Joey Banner. Joey was from a small farm across the river further down from Salty's. He was a timid man who lived alone and rarely talked to other than his dogs and ducks. People said he was one of God's children, or that he wasn't the full 100%. But whenever Dark had met him down the fields, he had noticed nothing wrong with his reasoning. I heard about Connie, said Joey, out of breath. Are you all right there, Arthur? Hey, Joey, I'm okay, thanks, but I have to go feed the cows. I'm sorry. Don't worry about that, said Joey. Here, I cooked a bit of a feed for yourself. He pushed a frying pan towards Dark. Dark noticed his trousers soaked to the top. In his hurry to deliver the sausages hot, he had not gone along the river to the points where you could ford it without the water going over your boots. Instead, he had run to the shortest route, a straight line across the fields. Joey also pulls out a jute sack. From it, he conjured two very large eggs. They're from Sadie and Mags, said Joey. The two best birds I have. The best in the world, I'd say. No cotton. Dark had never eaten a duck egg and he didn't like the idea of them. You sit in there now and eat them and I'll go and throw a drop of milk and a few nuts at the calves. The sausages on the big old black frying pan were the best Dark had ever tasted and he remembered he hadn't eaten since breakfast yesterday. Dark considered giving the eggs to the three best dogs in the world, but he couldn't bring himself to it. After so much effort to get them here, he was obliged to take them on. He ate them completely. When he was finished, Joey came back in and took the pan. Now, he said, them calves is grand. Thanks, said Dark. Joey slipped back off out across the fields without another word. Dark looked around. He wanted to be out of the house. He couldn't stop thinking about the hospital and the tubes and whether Connie would be coming back. His fears were crowding in on him. It was starting to rain and looked like it was down for the day. So there was no work he could do outside and he wouldn't be able to get to the hospital until someone came to collect him later. So he fed the dogs and cleaned himself up for school. On his way, he met a blue van from which a huge fat arm flagged him down. I was heading out to you there, Arthur, to see if you needed a hand. It was Baldy Kerwin from down the road. No thanks, said Dark. Brian is there now at the cows. Well, why don't you put the bike in the back and hop in here so I can drive you, said Kerwin. There's a good man. Dark was disconcerted by Kerwin's efforts at being nice. He uncertainly put his bike in with the empty toolboxes and in the back of the JJK builder's van. Kerwin had been an occasional visitor in Connie's kitchen. Not overly welcome because of his language so foul that it made even Queenie wince. Still, Dark would have preferred that Kerwin to this one. Kerwin turned the van and headed in towards town. He drove with only his knee on the wheel as he phoned several others relaying Dark's text message from the hospital. Helen says Connie had a good night, 
he said with an unnatural hushed politeness like he was trying out a new language and Arthur is grand. He dropped dark at school and said that he'd keep in contact with the other people around and give any help needed. Dark thanked him, but it didn't make him feel good to have a hardy book like Kerwin talking so carefully to him. It was like the respectful air he had felt at a wake, where everyone rallied up to help out, trying to distract the relatives and themselves with busyness. School was a haze. At break time when the other lads headed into town, he stood at the school wall with the smokers. He noticed Kira hanging out with Kevin across the grounds. They were laughing. Kevin gave her a hug. Why should he care about that? Anyway, he had probably been getting ahead of himself. She was never really officially with him. He was determined not to let anyone see that he had lost any feather. The talk with the lads was not unusual. Top gear, hurling, paintballing and other stuff. Anything except school or home or whether you were feeling like shit. Which was all fine except for every time he caught sight of her and Kevin. He had even less reason to be in school now. Shortly after they had gone back in during maths, he heard McLean shouted familiarly on a loud hailer. It wasn't the school intercom. Through the window, he saw it was the Mac, looking even more enormous next to the school gates. The door of the bright orange vehicle opened and down the steps climbed the red. He didn't bother coming in on school ground. A murmur of astonishment went around the classroom. The red just stood at the turnstile, barely as tall as it, and gave a thumbs up. Excuse me, miss, Dark said to Miss Sullivan as he stood up and headed for the door. She just rolled her eyes and made a clucking noise. Lucky beggar, whispered Sneakers. Others giggled. Well, said the red, by way of greeting. All right, said Dark, thanks for the lift. No bother, no bother. I want to have a chat with the man myself, said the Red, still showing none of the respectful waking tone of the neighbours. He laughed when Dark asked him what he thought about Connie. He owes me a few good turns, and may the devil mend me if we let them depart before he gets his chance to make good on them. And the music hadn't exactly turned mournful either. He had replaced the disco music with vintage rap, and the cab was vibrating with the noise. Dark asked him what he meant by we, not letting Connie depart. By we, Arturo, good buddy, I mean you. And he laughed again. Why do you think I'm driving you down to him? The red was making as much sense as ever, so Dark just sat back and tried to sleep. A large friendly nurse took them through to ICU. His mother was asleep in the chair beside the plastic tent. Connie wasn't asleep and the pain on his face dissolved for a minute as he tried to greet them. He barely managed a nod. It must have been the shock that hit Dark. He couldn't say anything for a minute. He was just staring at the tube coming out of Connie's nostril and at the large bony head. Someone had trimmed the beard and made him look like a much older man. Well, the Red shouted, still in the bed, you big lazy arsehole. Connie tried to laugh. Dark's mother woke up and hugged Dark and thanked the Red. Dark regained himself. He gave Connie his usual report. One cow with mastitis, two yearlings not thriving. He had given them a worm drench. The protein was up in the milk, according to the printouts from the co-op. So the new feed mix was working. The dogs were well. That was about it. Connie was looking at him with raised eyebrows, waiting for more. Both his mother and the Red were also looking at Dark now, not guessing what Connie was asking him. He just nodded at Connie reassuringly. Connie relaxed then. Being in the city, being in this modern hospital, Dark suddenly felt a panic of cold reality sweep over him. All this high-tech equipment, the electronics and monitors, all this scientific modern knowledge of the body and of microorganisms and how everything works, this was the real world. He'd been keeping his head in the sand all along and was wasting precious time thinking about cranes, stoats and fairy men. Most likely, there was some simple explanation, something the medics had overlooked, something they hadn't checked out properly. What do they say now, ma'am? He said to his mother. Still running more tests, she said. Do you want to go back to the B&B, &B, Helen? 
said the red. Me and Arthur can sit here with this Egypt. No thanks, she says. There needs to be someone with him through the night. Sure we can stay the night. Couldn't we, Arthur? said the Reds. I brought a deck of cards and we can see whether he's as good at cheating through that old fertiliser bag. I'd prefer to stay, said Dark's mother quietly. Arthur, I think Connie would be more contented if you were at home keeping an eye on things. Connie nodded. Dark knew that the reason Connie wanted him at home was not to mind the cows. If only to set his mind at ease, Dark nodded too. But he was already thinking of a different tack, a real world tack. The Red drove Dark home. The drive back was quieter. He was playing weird music from a CD just called Afro Jasmania. <laughs> when they got there, he offered to stay over if Dark was lonely. Dark said he was fine. Good enough then, buddy, said the Red, texting Dark his newest phone number. The Reds got a new SIM card every month. He disappeared down the driveway. Dark stood at the front door watching for no particular reason. Instead of going right towards town, the headlights turned left, which was strange because that road only went up into the forestry in the hills. Maybe he was off lamping deer or something. Determined to keep his focus on reality now, the idea occurred to Dark that the practical thing for him to do was to get a look at the hospital records. He didn't expect to understand much, but he might be able to find out for sure if they had ever looked into that bite. Just maybe, this was the little overlooked detail that was key to helping them save Connie. He knew he would only be made feel foolish if he asked them about it again. The records would surely be stored electronically and on some server at the hospital. And surely the hospital network was hooked onto the internet. If it could be broken into, he knew the only one person who would be able to do it. He had a funny feeling about calling his friend. He hadn't talked to him for a few days. He didn't feel like talking to him now, but he had to put that out of his mind. Kevin had been Kira's friend before Dark knew either of them. And if there was more now, well, that was their business. There were more important things at stake. He phoned. Kevin was very cheerful and friendly. Almost overly so, maybe. Dark was tired and didn't know if his own thoughts were paranoid. He chatted to Kevin as normal and neither of them said anything about Kira. He started f telling Kevin what he wanted. That's mad, boy, whispered Kevin. That'd be nearly impossible, I'd say. It'd be like trying to get into a military computer. That's what you said the time we messed up the school test records, said Dark. Completely different ball game, completely different league. I don't think it can be done. Or at least it could take a long time. But could you try? How soon do you need us? Tonight. Christ, forget it, bud, laughed Kevin. Why not just get your uncle to ask for the records? Did you ever think about doing anything the easy way, Arthur? He's sick, Kevin, like I told you, said Dark angrily. You didn't really tell me. Sorry, Dark. Is he very sick? Very sick. Tubes and wires and... Dark paused. Then he said, It's like this, Kev. He is dying, right? What else do you want me to say? Sorry, Dark. Really sorry, said Kevin. Then he made his distracted clicking sounds like he was calling his dog. He started talking to himself in the language of his world. A world that he had learned to mostly keep private so as to seem normal. It was what made him and Dark such close friends from the beginning. Must check privacy regulations. Records must be encrypted, but only to TEA128. Hopefully Oracle and Linux environments. Arthur stopped hearing once Kevin's talking went past firewalls and database security. Thanks, he said. I'll see you tomorrow. Maybe a week if I'm lucky, but I will start right now. I'll try, I'll try my best, but I promise. There was nothing else for Dark to do now. It was out of his hands. So after feeding the dogs, he went to the Ra. 
No longer needing to parse what they were telling him for clues about birds or stoats, he could purely enjoy the warmth of the home of the little people, the absence of pitying looks and the transport from his concerns. The old man asked how he was progressing in his search for the noble lady. There was a hint of an accusing note, or maybe Derek imagined that. Everyone seemed to pay close attention to his non-answer. All right, he muttered. He had no inclination to explain to them that he expected nothing more of them. That from there on, help would come only from modern and sensible sources. The old man looked at him and threw him. Eventually he said, good enough then. And pointing at Atain, who had appeared with her goblet, he added, don't ever refuse an offering from good hands. Whatever that was supposed to mean. Dart didn't care. He wanted to be away and he took the chalice without question. <laughs>